Jane Austen is more popular today than she ever was. Her novels are adored the world over, and film and TV versions have brought them to millions more. Her insights into human nature, especially when engaged in the treacherous business of courtship, are as sharp and witty as when she originally wrote them. And the people who inhabit her novels are unforgettable. Mr. Darcy! fascinated by her, not just because I played one of her characters, the repellent Miss Bingley in Pride and Prejudice, but because she's quite literally in my blood. Jane Austen is my great aunt from eight generations ago. But she is something of a mystery. She left no diaries, and her sister Cassandra made a bonfire of the letters she thought too personal. From her novels, it's easy to imagine her living a life of leisure, like one of her heroines, and finding happiness with an ideal husband. But was it really like that? This is the story of the real Jane Austen. The first mystery is, what did Jane actually look like? The only known portrait of her was done by her sister Cassandra in 1810 when she was 35. A niece of hers said that it was hideously unlike, but the rest of the family agreed it was close enough. They had it copied by a watercolourist and then engraved the first biography in 1870. The eyes were made bigger, a tribute of affection, they said. I much prefer Cassandra's scribble with her bright eyes showing signs of strain and her arms crossed with a certain defiance. It suggests her intelligence and her struggle. Descriptions from those who remembered her very wildly, enough to conjure up several quite different Janes. Hers was the first face that I can remember thinking pretty. Full round cheeks, bright hazel eyes and brown hair forming natural curls close round her face. Not so regularly handsome as her sister. The face by no means so broad and plump as represented, somewhat stiff and cold to strangers. A tall, thin, spare person with very high cheekbones, great colour, Sparkling eyes, not large, but joyous and intelligent. Her intelligence was the one thing everyone agreed on. A quality not considered an advantage for a young woman in those days. A woman especially, if she have the misfortune of knowing anything, should conceal it as well as she can. My great-aunt Jane grew up in a tiny village in Hampshire, it feels almost as remote as it was in the 1700s, when there was nothing but a few houses and a single row of mud cottages for the farm labourers. There was no inn, no shop, no school, and no doctor. Babies delivered themselves. It's amazing for me to be here, because on this spot once stood my ancestor's home, Stevenson Parsonage, and all that's left of it today is that pump over there, which is the only supply of water to the Austin home. It was a big old rambling family house, rather ramshackle and dilapidated. So much so that by the 1820s it was found unfit to live in and tragically knocked down. It was here on the 16th of December 1775 that Jane Austen was born. Her father remarked that she arrived a little later than expected. He would doubt this been for some time in expectation of hearing from Hampshire, and perhaps wondered a little that we were in our old age grown such bad reckoners. But so it was. For Mrs. Austin certainly expected to have been brought to bed a month ago. However, last night the time came, and without a great deal of warning, Everything was soon happily over. We now have a present plaything for little Cassie and a future companion. She is to be Jenny. Mr. and Mrs. Austin had been married for 11 years and already had six children. 
James, a studious ten-year-old, sweet-natured Edward, Henry, the charmer of the tribe, destined to be Jane's favourite brother, sturdy little Frank, and well-behaved Cassie, who'd become her closest friend. The Austins must have hoped Jane was their last child. After all, many women died giving birth, and they got this far safely. Separate bedrooms was the usual form of birth control, but the Austins didn't adopt it, and there would be one more baby to come. This brood of children cost money to raise, and though the Austins were a respectable family, they were not rich. At the time of Jane's birth, Mr. Austin was heavily in debt. He was a clergyman who had struggled from humble beginnings. Orphaned young, he made his way with scholarships to Oxford and then into the church. Money was always short, and he had to supplement his low income by farming his land and taking in pupils to teach alongside his own boys. As for Mrs. Austin, she came from altogether grander stock. My mother was particular about people's noses, having what she described as a rather aristocratic one. She was very proud of her links with high society. She boasted connections with the Duke of Chandos and reminded us of them often. Persuaded by Papa's charm rather than his income, she married him and wholeheartedly took up her position as country parson's wife. My mother was more practical than romantic, and more sensible than sentimental. Mrs. Austin's system of child rearing was an unusual one. Like her siblings, Jane was nursed by her mother for a few months to give her a good start. Then after her christening, she was handed over to a woman from the village to be looked after for a year or two. I christened this child Jane. Name the father, son. All my children were cared for in the village until they reached the age of reason. When they were able to walk, talk and feed themselves properly, they were brought home. No harm came of such an arrangement. Oh, it was a simple plan. If these modest requirements were not achieved, you did not return to the parsonage. My poor brother George could not speak and suffered from fits. He was sent away to be cared for in another village further away. He never came home. Brother Edward was far more fortunate. He made such an impression on our rich cousins, the Knights, that Mama allowed them to adopt him as their own son. You can't help but wonder what effect this exile from home must have had on the Austin children. In some of her later letters, Jane comes over as someone hard-shelled and a little distant. You can see from these letters that Jane was growing up to be as brisk as her mother. It's a tough young woman who jokes about a neighbour who gave birth to a dead child. Owing to a fright, she says, I suppose she happened unawares to look at her husband. There's not much pity in these letters for others and not much for herself either. Jane left her village nurse and returned to a lively household full of the clatter of boys, a mixture of brothers and pupils. Mrs. Austin had her hands full looking after the family home, the kitchen, the vegetable garden and the poultry yard. Though there were maids to help, it was an enormous task. A woman was expected to run a large household-like clockwork. Mama was so busy that she was happy for Jane to turn to me, and we became the closest friends. My mother expected us to acquire all her domestic skills. She said that we would need them when we were married in our turn and had our own households. So we tended the vegetable garden and the poultry yard and learnt to cook and sew. We were taught to make our brother's shirts, tiny stitches, hour after painstaking hour. I noticed Jane did not inflict shirt-making on any of her heroines. 
This was basic training for girls preparing for the marriage market. There was also a whole host of other social skills that would increase her chances of catching a husband. In Pride and Prejudice, there's a lively debate about what constitutes the truly accomplished lady. A woman must have a thorough knowledge of music, singing, drawing, dancing, and all the modern languages to deserve the word. And besides all this, she must possess a certain something in her air and manner of walking, the tone of her voice, her address and expressions, or the word will be but half deserved. After dinner, we would sometimes push the chairs back and dance in the parlour. Jane was quick to land the steps and always the most eager to be on the floor. She would urge us all to join in, even her papa. I can never forget her joy in dancing. Her feet flew and her eyes shone. We were very happy, all together at home. But money was always a problem. My father was obliged to take in more pupils, and to make room, Cassie and I were sent away. Jane was only seven years old when she was sent to school in Oxford. Boarding schools for girls were not hard to find in the 1780s. It was one of the few ways a single woman could earn a respectable living. But the accounts of what went on in them were depressing. Jane reflected this later in her work when she wrote in Emma of establishments where girls might be sent to be out of the way and for enormous pay might be screwed out of health and into vanity. Our schoolmistresses were unhappy, ignorant creatures. We were taught spelling, some French, and a little needlework. Just thought a waste of time to teach girls all the languages, arts, and sciences. Grace and manners were what mattered most. Knowledge may gain a woman some applause, but will not add one lover to her list. Already in Jane's early life, some crucial questions were raised. Was it enough that women were groomed to be pretty, docile companions for men? When she later wrote Northanger Abbey, Henry Tilney, a more enlightened male, criticizes this assumption. The advantages of natural folly in a pretty girl are well known, are they not? And you, Miss Morland, strike me as nothing if not natural. Henry, do you want Miss Morland to think you're a brute in your opinion of women? A brute? My dear sister. To the larger part of my sex, imbecility in females is a great enhancement of their charms. Come now, own it. You know it's true. But as I am far too reasonable to demand anything more than ignorance. And now, Henry, I think you should add a little something in case Miss Morland misunderstands you. She's not used to your odd ways. I shall be most happy to make her better acquainted with her. I meant only to say that Miss Morland is not one of those romantic heroines she so enjoys reading about. She tells us frankly she is not accomplished in music, nor in drawing. She does not go in for exaggerated displays of feeling, and worst of all, I do believe she says what she means. I'm afraid she really will not do. When I reached the age of 11, my father announced that our school days were over. We returned home happily and very little wiser for the experience. My father's books were waiting for me. The best of her education was at home. Books were the one luxury of the house and all the family were passionate readers. Jane began to work her way through her father's great collection. A person, be it gentleman or lady, who has not pleasure in a good novel must be intolerably stupid. The employment of the mind, the dissipation of unpleasant ideas which only reading can produce, has always been a great comfort to me. My sister was a shy child, but she soon discovered another world, the world of the imagination, which amused her far more than school had ever done. I watched her reading, hour after hour, often late into the night, and... I became the one with whom she shared her most private thoughts and dreams. Mr. and Mrs. Austin were open-minded enough to let their daughter take whatever she wanted from the shelves. 
So alongside the histories and the plays she read, she picked up titles which some people thought quite unsuitable for a clergyman's daughter. Like the story of Tom Jones, a lecherous cad, as well as other steamy novels by Richardson, who wrote of sex and seduction. This rich mixture began to feed Jane's extraordinary imagination. Jane began to write her own stories, and what surprises she gave us. There were man traps, guiltings, elopements, unmarried mothers, disgusting food and a great deal of drunkenness. Parents were murdered by their children, and hungry children ate their mother's fingers. Mr. Austin took real delight in his daughter's unexpected talent and bought Jane her own exquisite mahogany writing desk. This is the writing desk given to Jane by her father and it's absolutely beautiful. I think it shows his support and his encouragement of her work. He supplied her with notebooks, one of which he's written... Effusions of fancy by a very young lady consisting of tales in a style entirely new. And one of those tales was the history of England, illustrated by Cassandra for the amusement of the family, and a very funny picture of Elizabeth I, who they detested. And Jane has promised to be a partial, prejudiced and ignorant historian, giving very few dates. Throughout her teens, she turned out a stream of outrageously nonsensical stories and plays, much to the amusement of her family. They expressed the opinions and interests which would appear in her later writing. Wit, mischief, irrepressible humour, and an eye for the weakness, folly, and malice of humanity. At the age of 16, she wrote a savage tale of a mercenary bride entitled The Three Sisters. I am the happiest creature in the world, for I have received an offer of marriage from Mr. Watts. I do not intend to accept it. He is quite an old man, about two and thirty. Very plain, so plain that I cannot bear to look at him. He's extremely disagreeable, and I hate him more than anybody else in the world. He has a large fortune, and will make great settlements on me. But then, he is very healthy. If I accept him, I know I shall be miserable all the rest of my life. The mercenary nature of marriage was becoming an increasing preoccupation for Jane, as she saw one family wedding after another. Three of her brothers made very good marriages. A good marriage, as everyone understood, was one that brought money. Edward, the lucky brother adopted by rich relations, was now heir to their estates, and he carried off a Kentish baronet's daughter. James, who became a clergyman, found the granddaughter of a duke. Henry, a dashing army officer, married his cousin Eliza, the rich widow of a French aristocrat. But Cassandra failed by comparison. She became engaged to a penniless young clergyman, Tom Fowle. Because he was poor, they couldn't hope to marry until he'd made some money. So she stayed at home and waited while he took a chaplaincy in the West Indies. The business of courtship and marriage, and it was a business, was crucial for women in an age when the professions were close to them. Money came from a father or a husband. Single women have a dreadful propensity for being poor, which is one strong argument in favour of matrimony. There is no freedom for a woman without money. My aunt was forced to travel to India to marry a man she did not know and could not care for. Her personal attractions gained her a wealthy husband, but the marriage was so contrary to her wishes, so repugnant to her feelings, that she would almost have preferred servitude.
Jane used her aunt's experience in a story she began when she was 16, making her heroine, Catherine, ask indignantly, Do you call it lucky for a girl of genius and feeling to be sent in quest of her husband to Bengal? To be married there to a man whose disposition she has no opportunity of judging till judgment is of no use to her? who may be a tyrant, or a fool, or both, for what she knows to the contrary. Jane lived in a world where it was universally acknowledged that marriage was a market, and this is to become the central theme of her novels. In Pride and Prejudice, Mrs. Bennet spends her entire life scheming to marry off her five girls to the richest possible candidates. My dear, Mr. Bennet, wonderful news! Netherfield Park is let at last, is it? Yes, it is, for I have just had it from Mrs. Long. And do you not want to know who has taken it? You want to tell me, and I have no objection to hearing it. Why, then, it is taken by a young man of large fortune from the north of England. A single man of large fortune, my dear. He came down on Monday in Shayton Hall to see the place. His name is Beanley, and he will be in possession by Nicholas. And he has five thousand a year. What a fine thing for our girls. How so? Um, how can it affect them? Oh, Mr. Bennett, how can you be so tiresome? You must know that I'm thinking of his marrying one of them. For a single man in possession of a good fortune must be one of a wife. <laughs> yes, he must indeed. And who better than one of our five girls? <laughs> Why don't you to choose me? <laughs> Although Jane recognised that marriage was all about money, at one stage in her life, a part of her still believed she could find true love. Here, Jane has written future imaginary husbands in her father's parish register. We have Henry Frederick Howard Fitzwilliam of London, married to Jane Austen. Edmund Arthur William Mortimer of Liverpool, married to Jane Austen, and then spanning the social spectrum, we have Jack Smith, married to Jane Smith. With Cassandra, there was no problem. I could see her future settled with her own family, but with Jane, the Lord only knew where life would take her. Still, we had to hope a suitable young man might appear. Mrs. Austin made sure Jane didn't miss a single opportunity to catch her husband. local balls and parties, she found herself thrust into a social battlefield where the bloodiest campaigns were waged in a war to find the ideal spouse. Very quickly, Jane found herself at the front line. A handsome young Dubliner soon made his advance. My dear Cassandra, I am almost afraid to tell you how my Irish friend and I behaved. Imagine to yourself everything most profligate and shocking in the way of dancing and sitting down together. He is being laughed at about me. She's the prettiest, silliest little husband-hunting butterfly I ever remembered. This bad behaviour was carried on with a dazzling stranger, Tom Lefroy. He was 20 years old, the same age as Jane. He had a law degree from Dublin and was preparing to study for the bar in London. Meanwhile, he was enjoying a holiday with his aunt Lefroy, a neighbour of the Austins. He is a very gentlemanlike, good-looking, pleasant young man, I assure you. 
I can expose myself, however, only once more, because he leaves the country soon after next Friday, on which we are to have a dance at Ash. I was away from home, staying with my Tom's family, when Jane's letter reached me. After the first mention of Tom Lefroy, he kept making more and more appearances. She couldn't keep him off the page. After I had written the above, we received a visit from Mr. Tom Lefroy. He has but one fault, which time will I trust entirely remove. It is that his morning coat is a great deal too light. Jane did not even try to conceal her delight in her new friend. Every sentence of her letter spoke to me of her happiness and confidence that he was forming a deep attachment. I rather expect to receive an offer from my Irish friend in the course of the evening. I shall refuse him, however, unless he promises to give away his white coat. As for my other admirers, I mean to confine myself in future to Tom Lefroy, for whom I do not care a sixpence. We could all see what had happened. The whole neighbourhood was whispering of an engagement. It was out of the question. Jane is a dear, dear girl, and I fear that Tom behaved very ill towards her. There was no fortune on either side. He should not have raised her hopes when he was in no position to support a wife. He knew his father wanted him to make a good marriage. I sent him back to London to continue his studies, so no more mischief could be done. It was for the best. At length the days come on which I am to flirt my last with Tom Lefroy. And when you receive this, it will be over. My tears flow as I write at the melancholy idea. Jane joked about it, but it had been a painful experience. She'd let her feelings show. A mistake. She learnt that young men can be most dangerous when they are most entrancing. I believe young Lefroy was still in her thoughts three years later, when he turned up at Ash again. His aunt kept him well away from us and said nothing of the visit, but in our small society. Jane was bound to hear of it. She was too proud to ask about him. So I took it upon myself to question Mrs. Lefroy, and she told me he'd already gone back to London on his way to Ireland, where he was called to the bar. Soon after this, Tom Lefroy made his good marriage to an Irish heiress. He rose to be Lord Chief Justice of Ireland and a very pious gentleman. A young man so easily falls in love with a pretty girl for a few weeks, and when accident separates them, so easily forgets her. We live at home, quiet, confined, and our feelings prey upon us. Men are forced into exertion, Men have always a profession, pursuits, business of some sort or other to take them back into the world. We certainly do not forget them so soon as they forget us. Questioned by a nephew at the end of his long life, Lord Chief Justice Lefroy acknowledged he had indeed loved Jane. With Tom Lefroy behind her, Jane threw herself into her writing. Here at least she was in charge of the fates of her heroines. She found the perfect workplace in the dressing room she shared with Cassandra. I remember it well. The scanty furniture and cheaply papered walls, the blue and white striped curtains and how Aunt Cassandra would shut the door quietly and glide away, making sure she was left alone with her thoughts and her pen and paper. Jane's output was phenomenal. In just four years, three books were underway, Sense and Sensibility, Pride and Prejudice, and Northanger Abbey, in which she wrote her famous defense of the novel. A 
work in which the greatest powers of the mind are displayed, in which the most thorough knowledge of human nature, the happiest delineation of its varieties, the liveliest effusions of wit and humor are conveyed to the world in the best chosen language. A character is bring out her wicked side. She scrutinizes other people without forgiveness, but always with humor. Other way, Mr. Collins. Oh, Madam, a thousand. Oh, Mr. Collins. My dear cousin, I apologize. Clergymen are self-important and over-attentive to their social superiors. Rich girls patronize and put down poorer girls. Parents are often stupid and usually wrong. All flirtatious young men are a threat to unmarried girls, and the most dangerous beast of all is a handsome army officer. Some of her portraits are so unflattering, one could assume she had a dislike for people in general. But she never ridiculed what was wise or good. Follies and nonsense, whims and inconsistencies diverted her, I own, and she laughed at them whenever she could. Jane was careful not to set any of her novels in Hampshire, but it's easy to pick out some family resemblances in her characters. A touch of her brother Henry, for one, in her charming and unreliable young men. She drew from nature. But whatever may have been surmised to the contrary, never from individuals. But what came of this graft and toil? For women in Jane's day, writing was meant to be a pastime, not a profession. My sister became an authoress entirely from taste and inclination. Neither hope for fame nor profit mixed with her early motives. It was with great difficulty that her family could prevail upon her to offer her work for publication. Jane allowed me to read the novel she just completed. It made such an impression on me that I decided to approach a publisher. I wrote to Thomas Cattle in London. Well, you have to butter these fellows up a bit. I even offered to pay for the publication. Declined by return of post. The novel he rejected was Pride and Prejudice. He missed his chance, the fool. Allow me to present this young lady to you as a very desirable partner. Pride and Prejudice would become one of the most famous and treasured novels in English literature. The stormy courtship between the headstrong Elizabeth Bennet and the stubborn Mr. Darcy is told with restrained but intense passion. The irony is that none of the romance Jane gave her heroines came into her own life, for neither of the Austen sisters married. In the spring of 1797, the terrible news came that Cassandra's fiancé, Tom Fowle, for whom she'd waited so long, had died of a fever in the West Indies. Cassie behaved with a degree of resolution and propriety which no common mind could evince. As time passed, I encouraged her to consider other suitors, but she turned her face away from the world, determined never to consider marriage again. Cassandra was only 24. For her it meant an early passage into spinsterhood. Jane was heading down the same path as she showed no sign of finding a husband. Instead, their attachment to each other became the most important thing in their lives. My aunts were thought to have taken to the garb of middle age unnecessarily soon. I recollect how they walked in wintry weather through the sloppy lane between Steventon and Dean. I remember their bonnets, because though precisely alike in colour, shape and material, I made it a pleasure to guess, and I believe I always guessed right, which bonnet and which aunt belong to each other. Jane turned 25 at the beginning of the 19th century. She had three novels under her belt, each destined to be a classic. She seemed on the road to success. Then, mysteriously, she stopped writing.
this coincided with a disastrous upheaval in her life. While their daughters were away, Mr. and Mrs. Austin took the tremendous decision to leave their home in Steventon. Jane was returning from a stay with friends, and I was eager to tell her the good news. As she came through the door, I said, Well, it is all settled. Mr. Austin is to retire, and we have decided to leave Steventon and to go to Bath to live. We were to rent a house there and spend our summers visiting the coast. James, our eldest son, and his wife were to take over the parsonage. Jane's response to the news surprised us. She simply fainted. Jane was traumatized at the thought of leaving her home. But Mr. and Mrs. Austin were elated at the prospect of their new life of leisure and were in a hurry to leave. They said it was to be the holiday of their old age. They had no idea the harm they were doing. I was losing my home, my workplace, my routine, my books, my friends and neighbours. We were to turn our backs on the liberty and quiet of the country. Cassandra destroyed letters from Jane at this time. It's likely they expressed her pain and anger at her parents forcing her to leave the place she loved. I wonder that anyone should think I might betray my sister's confidence. Something she wrote for my eyes alone. Seize upon the scissors, she told me. I would never break her trust. Some letters had the offending portions cut out. Enough survives to show how much she resented her brother James's impatience to move into the parsonage. He and his wife took over with indecent haste. Her possessions were seized or sold. Her pictures, her books, even her beloved piano. Since her parents agreed to this, Jane was powerless. The whole world was in a conspiracy to enrich one part of our family at the expense of another. To make matters worse, Jane was being taken to a place that was completely alien to her. In 1800, Bath was the most famous resort town in England, a playground for the rich and fashionable, a place for pleasure and relaxation. But not for Jane. She described her first view of the city as all vapour, shadow, smoke and confusion. Everything that had enabled her to work was taken from her as she was plunged into its hideous social world. I found there enough varieties of tedium to drive me to despair. She was dragged from party to party, thrust into a desperate world of insincerity which only intensified her feelings of loss. No wonder she became too depressed to write. I wondered if the true reason for our upheaval was to parade us on the marriage market. Her letters from this time scream of her unhappiness. We attended a ball, a rather dull affair, although I am proud to say I have a very good eye for an adulteress. She was highly rouged and looked contentedly silly. We are to have a tiny party here tonight. I hate tiny parties. They force one into constant exertion. Another stupid party last night. Perhaps if larger, they might be less intolerable. Mrs. Badcock ran around the room after her drunken husband. Three old toffs came in and sat down to whist. Miss Langley is like any other short girl with a broad nose, wide mouth, fashionable dress and exposed bosom. I cannot anyhow continue to find people agreeable. Without a room of her own, without the pattern she'd established for her work, 
Jane found she could not take up her pen. The three novels she carried with her to Bath lay on a shelf like a reproach. I could do nothing, say nothing, only observe the change in her as though she were mourning what she had lost. At 27, Jane was unpublished and unmarried. If Mr. and Mrs. Austin had expected her to find a husband in Bath, they were disappointed. This was about to change when she and Cassandra escaped Bath for a visit to stay with their old neighbours, the Biggs, at many down in Hampshire. The daughters of the house were friends, and their younger brother Harris, a shy, stammering boy, five years younger than Jane, had just finished at Oxford and was looking for a wife. I must confess it came as a surprise that the dear boy had formed an attachment to Jane. His sisters were so eager to have Jane's company, we thought they might have given him a gentle push. At all events, he proposed to her on the first evening of her visit, and Jane accepted his proposal. The entire household was delighted, with one exception. Jane passed a sleepless night, the dilemma that faces all her heroines was before her. Should she marry for love or money? Though she did not love Harris Big, if she became his wife, her future would be secure. But she had once been in love, and the difference in her feelings now must have been too much to bear. It was horribly awkward. The next morning, she sought him out and explained, with the greatest delicacy, that she had made a mistake. She could not marry him. And then, of course, we had to leave at once and return to Bath. I was honoured by his proposal, and I esteemed him. But esteem and respect are not enough. Anything is to be preferred or endured rather than marrying without affection. Mr. Austin was too good to remind her she had nothing, not a penny, and could have no expectations from him. But I had my thoughts. She could have been mistress of many down. Not many girls would say no to that. She could have ensured our comfort in our advancing years, made a home for Cassandra, and assisted her brothers in their professions. But none of this counted with Jane, it appeared. Jane preferred the prospect of a future of poverty rather than one of unhappiness. Perhaps it was this that spurred her on to try and publish her work. She struggled to return to her writing and managed to make a new copy of Northanger Abbey. This time it was brother Henry who decided to help his sister. Being in business myself in London, I was in a position to approach a publisher. He liked what he read, paid ten pounds for it, and promised early publication. But the book failed to appear. This was the second fool of a publisher we had encountered. And for Jane, it was another blow. Their financial situation became more precarious when in January 1805, Mr. Austin died suddenly. The family's only source of income was gone. There was no pension or house for a clergyman's widow. At the age of 29, Jane was now entirely dependent on the goodwill of her brothers. I went to Bath for my father's funeral and to arrange matters for our dear trio of women. I was confident that Edward would give them £100 a year. James Frank and I put in another £50 each. Well, they had only to move into slightly smaller furnished lodgings, easily managed by one maid, and spend their summers making visits to family and friends. 
We were providing fully enough to ensure that my mother and sisters would be well, quite as rich as ever. With little money and no settled home, they were often obliged to stay at Godmersham in Kent, home of brother Edward, who now inherited the great estate of his adoptive parents. He had a brood of children and Jane was invited to look after them. However, she was often seen as the poor relation. She was not so refined as she ought to have been considering her talent. The Austins were not rich and the people around them with whom they chiefly mixed were not at all high-bred, or, in short, anything more than mediocre. Both the aunts were brought up in the most complete ignorance of the world and its ways, and if it had not been for Papa's marriage which brought them into Kent, they would have been, though not less clever and agreeable in themselves, very much below par as to good society and its ways. Jane resented relying on the charity of her relatives, but she tried to make the best of a bad situation. We must not all expect to be individually lucky. The luck of one member of a family is luck to all. It took some time for Edward to share his good luck. But eventually he made it possible for the Austin women to return to their beloved Hampshire. He offered them a charming cottage on his other estate in the sleepy village of Chawton. Jane was so delighted with their new house that she wrote a poem in praise of it. Our Chawton home, how much we find already in it to our mind, and how convinced that when complete it will all other houses beat, that ever have been made or mended with rooms concise or rooms distended. The effect on Jane of settling in a permanent home was dramatic. She was able to take up her pen in the old way. A black cloud lifted and her imagination was restored. Almost at once, she began to write again. Cassandra took on all the domestic responsibilities of the house so that Jane could find a daily routine for her work. She wrote upon small sheets of paper that could be easily put away or covered with a piece of blotting paper. She was careful that her occupation was never suspected by servants or visitors. There was between the front door and the offices a swing door that creaked when it was opened. But she objected to having this little inconvenience remedied as it gave her notice that anyone was coming. Her books were her darling children. I am never too busy to think of sense and sensibility. I can no more forget it than a mother can forget a sucking child. Jane saw other women burdened with too many babes and she rejoiced in her own freedom. Poor animals, she called her brother's wives, as well she might, three of them died in childbirth. And soon she saw her children go out into the world and prosper. At last, Henry found a publisher, and Sense and Sensibility was advertised on the 31st of October, 1811, as a new novel by a lady. Jane would allow nothing more. She'd be no lady if the secret were out. Another woman writer said, I'd rather exhibit as a rope dancer than see my name printed on the title page. Sense and Sensibility became the talk of London dinner tables. Fashionable people said that nothing had been published for years to compare with it. Pride and Prejudice followed in 1813 to even greater acclaim, and Jane took intense pleasure in her success and the money it brought her. 
I have now written myself into 250 pounds, which only makes me long for more. With her newfound wealth, she sends some dress material to Cassandra, writing, Remember that it is a present. Do not refuse me. I am very rich. Within the family, we were greatly proud of Jane's success. I gave her my opinion of each of her characters. She surpassed herself with Mr. Collins. When the finished copies of Pride and Prejudice arrived at Chawton, she invited me to read with her. The neighbours who made our audience had no idea she was the author. No one deserved success more. The playwright Sheridan recommended Pride and Prejudice to me as one of the best things he'd ever read. Another gentleman assured me that it was much too clever to be the work of a woman. <laughs> Henry heard Pride and Prejudice warmly praised in Scotland, and what did he do in the warmth of his brotherly vanity and love, but immediately tell them who wrote it? The secret had spread so far that when my next book appeared, I could not even attempt to tell lies about it. I resolved to make all the money, rather than all the mystery I could of it. Now the secret was out, Jane attracted an important, if unpopular, admirer. The Prince Regent. Like her countrymen, she detested this drunken and philandering monarch and was not pleased to be invited to dedicate her next novel, Emma, to His Royal Highness. I resisted the idea until it was pointed out that a royal suggestion is a royal command. Then I proposed simply, Emma, dedicated by permission to His Royal Highness the Prince Regent. But this was not enough and the dedication appeared with a lavish supply of three royal highnesses and a prince regent. At the height of her newfound success when she was 39, Jane began to feel ill. For a year she made light of it and kept busy working on her next novel, Persuasion. I knew something was amiss with her even though all her willpower was deployed to resist and deny the illness. Sometimes she seemed better, and then more symptoms declared themselves. I noticed that when Aunt Jane lay down after dinner, she lay upon three chairs, which she arranged herself. She called it her sofa. And even when the real sofa in the drawing room was unoccupied, she never took it. She said that if she were to use it, Grandmama would be leaving it for her and would not lie down as she frequently did whenever she felt inclined. I was struck by the alteration in her. She grew very pale, her voice was weak and low, and there was about her a general appearance of debility and suffering. She supported all the varying pain, irksomeness, and tedium attendant upon a decaying nature, with more than resignation, with true cheerfulness. She wrote while she could hold a pen, and then with a pencil when a pen became too laborious. Jane's illness is still a mystery. Her symptoms included blackening of the skin, sickness, and fevers. Modern medicine has suggested Addison's disease, which affects the adrenal glands or a lymphoma, a type of cancer. Jane continued to put on a brave face until in the April of 1817, she secretly wrote her will. Though she can't have had too much faith in her own recovery, she agreed to be taken to Winchester to be under the care of surgeons there. Mr. Lightfoot says he will cure me, she wrote to her nephew. This was her last letter. Her last weeks were spent here at College Street, close to the cathedral. There were days of hope, and then she sank again. Then, on the 18th of July, Jane suffered a seizure. She felt herself to be dying about half an hour before she became tranquil and apparently unconscious. 
During that half hour was her struggle, poor soul. She said she could not tell us what she suffered, though she complained of little fixed pain. When asked if there was anything she wanted, her answer was, nothing but death. From that time till half was four, when she ceased to breathe, she scarcely moved a limb. A slight motion of the head with every breath remained. I sat close by her with a pillow in my lap to assist in supporting her head, which was almost off the bed for six hours. I was able to close her eyes myself. I have lost a treasure. Such a sister, such a friend as can never have been surpassed. She was the sun in my life, the gilder of every pleasure, the soother of every sorrow. I had not a thought concealed from her. And it is as if I have lost part of myself. My great aunt was only 41 when she died. She'd had little time to enjoy the success of her four published novels. Five months after her death, Cassandra printed two remaining manuscripts, Northanger Abbey and Persuasion. Just six books in all. Had she lived longer, imagine what other classics she might have left us. A tombstone in Winchester Cathedral tells of the benevolence of her heart and the sweetness of her temper but fails to mention her greatest claim to fame. Her family chose not to reveal Jane was a writer because she'd made money out of her talent, and for a woman, that was frowned upon. Men have had every advantage of us in telling their own story. Education has been theirs in so much higher a degree. The pen is in their hands. Jane Austen changed all that. Great writers take us by surprise. Never married, never rich, Jane Austen wrote with precision and passion of dream lovers and brilliant marriages. She armed her heroines with wit and courage to take on a world ruled by men and money. And as she did, she herself, a woman, single and poor, became one of the world's great novelists. Stay with us, all new Only Connect, coming up here on BBC Four in just a moment. <laughs> 